Welcome to the training video on the FY 2021 Performance Data Form, Modules 1 and 2. My name is Melissa Torgerson, and the purpose of today's webinar is to provide an in-depth overview of the LIHEAP Performance Data Form, both Module 1, the Grantee Survey, and Module 2, Performance Measures. We'll also explain the approach for reporting on supplemental funds, including ARPA and CARES Act. The audience for this webinar includes new LIHEAP coordinators and staff who have not worked on completing these forms, as well as experienced LIHEAP coordinators and staff that would like to review the requirements in detail, understand all of the instructions, and avoid reporting issues. This slide provides an outline of the different topics that we'll be covering during today's training. While we won't walk through these now, it's a useful reference when you want to look at this presentation again later. So let's start with an overview of module one and two. The performance data form is one report consisting of three modules. Module one is the grantee survey, module two includes performance measures, and module three includes optional performance measures. Both modules one and two are mandatory, and those are the topics that we'll be covering in today's webinar. LIHEAP grantees are required to complete numerous reports throughout the year that cover different aspects of the program. For example, the model plan at the beginning of the fiscal year asks grantees to lay out what their program will look like, including program components, benefit determination procedures, and benefit levels. The grantee survey looks at how you spent your money and obligated your money. So how, where you obligated funds, what the average household benefit was, as well as income eligibility criteria. The household report looks at people and who you served. So household served by an assistance type and total household served, as well as looking at poverty intervals and vulnerability status. And finally, performance measures look at the impact of the program on people. So how did we change the attitudes and behaviors and conditions of the households that we're serving with LIHEAP? And in particular, we're gonna look at and the reduction of energy burden, the way that we targeted benefits, whether we restored energy service or prevented the loss of energy service in the home. Hi, so everyone. Oh, sorry, Melissa. Hi, everyone. My name is Connor Priest. I am a policy analyst at Apprise. I've been helping to work on these reports for about three years, and I'm going to be helping Melissa um, a little bit with this training video today, a few portions. Um, right now, I just want to cover right up front some of the major changes that uh, have been implemented to both the grantee survey and the performance measures. Um, as you know, the grantee survey was updated a little bit uh, last year in fiscal year 2020 to incorporate reporting for CARES Act funds. Um, and this year, with the introduction of ARPA funds for fiscal year 2021, HHS has opened up lines that were reserved for reporting on one additional supplemental funding type and grantees are now going to need to report information on all three of the different federal funding types that they've gotten. So that would include your regular LIHEAP funds from your usual annual block grant or your reallotment funds. Um, that would also include your LIHEAP CARES Act funds, and then now also uh, another portion for your LIHEAP ARPA funds. And besides the additional reporting for ARPA, OCS has also made some other minor changes to the performance data form, and we're gonna cover those in more detail as we go through our line by line. So the performance data form expired in April, and so OCS had to submit proposed changes to the form to OMB, and those went through a public review process and then were approved in late February. And recently, um, on March 14th, OCS issued the action transmittal with the instructions to complete the form. And the initial due date that they included as part of the action transmittal is March 31st. And as with uh, fiscal year 2020 last year, 
OCS this year will be asking grantees to submit the 2021 performance data form using the Basecamp platform via an Excel spreadsheet. And each grantee will be receiving a communication to provide them with the link to their Basecamp folder. And within that folder, you'll have your blank Excel spreadsheet. Um, this last point on the slide is, is pretty important. Um, the Excel spreadsheet, especially for the grantee survey, um, will include customized pre-populated data that aligns with each of your um, states specifically. So you won't be able to just use the generic one that they sent out as an example. You'll have to use the specific sheet that is in Basecamp for your state. And this slide is just kind of a quick look at what that um, looks like. You can see there are already some pre-populated amounts. Any of the boxes that you see that are gray throughout the form, dark kind of gray or blue like that, are the ones that have been um, pre-populated or locked for editing. So now let's walk through an overview of module one of the grantee survey. So the grantee survey is a report that's been around a while and it focuses on grantees uses of funds by assistance type. There are really three types of data that need to be reported in this form. The amount of funds obligated to different LIHEAP components like heating or cooling, the average LIHEAP benefits provided to households, and the maximum annual income limits for a four-person household. The grantee survey provides a snapshot of how LIHEAP funds are used each fiscal year, how benefits are being distributed to households, and how grantees are setting eligibility criteria. So the first part of module one, the grantee survey, is all about sources of funds. So this collects and reports data on the sources of LIHEAP funding that were available to your state in FY 2021. If you think of this like a checkbook or a bank account, this is looking at the deposit. And sources of funds should include all federal funds designated for LIHEAP in FY 2021 as well as prior year unobligated funds that were obligated in FY 2021. In this particular form, sources of funds include FY 2021 LIHEAP block grant allotment, these are your regular funds, FY 2021 reallotment funds, the CARES Act allotment, the ARPA allotment, as well as any FY 2020 unobligated funds carried over to FY 2021. There are some things that do not belong on this form. For example, federal funds designated for LIHEAP that were obligated in prior fiscal years. So for example, some of you may have obligated uh, funds in FY 2020, but not spent them until FY 2021. That doesn't matter because we're only looking at obligations. So those funds that have already been obligated prior to 2021 would not go on this form. Funds that were dedicated as set-asides to Indian tribes or tribal organizations. And so these are funds that are given directly to tribal entities in a state from HHS. As well as non-federal funds, many of you leverage other state funds or fuel funds um, to use in conjunction with LIHEAP. However, these dollars um, do not belong on this form. Um, only CARES and and ARPA funds from the federal government would belong on this form. So some of you may have gotten CARES or ARPA from your state, um, and those would not, would not be included. So part A lays all of what we just talked about out. Um, and as Connor mentioned, um, these blue gray boxes are fields that are locked for editing. So um, some of them will be zeroed out because they're not relevant for this year's form, and some of them are pre-populated using information from HHS. Only three lines are actually relevant for 2021, the block grant allotment, reallotted funds, and funds carried over from the previous year. Lines one and three are pre-populated using information from OCS records and prior reports. And although they're locked to prevent editing, you should double check these against your own records of allocations and allotments from the federal government to make sure they're correct. 
and if you believe they might be incorrect, you should contact a prize for assistance in unlocking these cells to fix them. Line five is also pre-populated and based on your carryover uh, report that you submitted for FY um, 2020 and 2021. But it's not locked uh, because we know that some people kind of true up this number um, at the end of the year after that form has already been submitted. And so um, it allows you to edit this number to be more accurate. In section three, part A, the following items are not applicable for FY 2021 reporting. Item two, which is emergency contingency funds. Item four, which is unobligated emergency contingency funds. Item six, which is um, oil overcharge funds, um, as well as seven, seven B and eight, which are all reach and leveraging incentive programs that are uh, not in place for this year. And so each of these will be pre-populated with a zero and they will be uh, grayed out and locked for editing. So next we have section three, part B, and this section is actually just one line. And that is uh, to provide a sum of your sources of non-supplemental funding. Um, that have been appropriated by Congress and awarded by OCS. And um, this will just be a sum of items one through nine above in part eight. And this field will be um, grayed out and locked for editing, but you should just double check it to make sure that the math there aligns with what you see in your fiscal records. So moving on to part C, this includes three lines for reporting supplemental LIHEAP funding sources or categories that were appropriated by Congress and awarded to you by OCS. And um, this is where you're gonna be reporting information on your LIHEAP CARES Act and ARPA allotments. So item 11 is for reporting any unobligated CARES Act funds that were carried over from fiscal year 2020 for use in fiscal year 2021 um, or obligation. Um, this amount should match the CARES carryover amount you reported in your fiscal year 2020 grantee survey and fiscal year 2020 carryover and reallotment report. Um, any grantees who obligated 100% of their CARES funds in fiscal year 2020 will end up reporting $0 in this field. And this item uh, is going to be pre-populated using information from your prior reports. But if you believe that the pre-populated value on line 11 is incorrect, we have left it unlocked for you to um, go ahead and fix that. As Melissa said, we know that some of those numbers get sort of finalized after um, the previous year's reporting. Um, one reminder for CARES is that grantees must have obligated all of their CARES funds by the end of fiscal year 2021. Um, item 12 is where you're going to be reporting your state's ARPA allotment. Um, this line will include your total LIHEAP ARPA allotment, even if you didn't obligate that full amount. Um, in fiscal year 2021. So if you, even if you're saving some of your ARPA funds for fiscal year 2022 or beyond, um, you're still going to put the full amount that was um, allotted to you there. Um, this item is going to be pre-populated using information from OCS, and we're going to have it locked to prevent editing. But again, if you feel that that information is incorrect, you should you know, definitely double check it and let us know and we can help you unlock it if that becomes necessary. Finally, item 13 here is not applicable. It's just reserved if, in case there are any other supplemental funding sources in the future. So we're just gonna have this pre-populated as zero dollars and it will be locked to prevent editing. So let's talk about section four of module one, which is estimated uses of LIHEAP funds. So just as the sources of funds talked about the deposit, the uses of funds is going to be essentially talking about our withdrawals. So how did we 
um, how did the funds go out of our program and, and, and into our state or community? Use as a fund should include all federal funds and awards that were obligated during federal fiscal year 2021 for use in LIHEAP. For FY 2021, this includes all federal funds obligated during FY 2021, even if they were expended later, say in FY 2022. Unobligated funds from FY 2020 that were carried over and obligated in FY 2021, and unobligated funds from FY 2021 being carried over for obligation in FY 2022. It's important to note here that the definition of obligation is um, set by the state or the grantee. And so you might want to visit that to make sure that when you're reporting on obligated numbers, you're using the definition that's been set out by your, your state or tribe. Use as a fund should not include the following. Funds that were obligated during FY 2020, even if they were expended during FY 2021. So for example, you may have obligated FY 2020 LIHEAP funds for weatherization, but you didn't weatherize homes until FY 2021. Funds available during fiscal year 2021 that were not obligated by the end of fiscal year 2021 and will be returned to OCS. So um, in some cases, you may have not obligated funds in excess of the allowable carryover limit. And so um, those funds would uh, not be included in your use as a funds section. And then non-federal funds, such as leveraged state funds or fuel funds, um, so even though these are often used in conjunction with LIHEAP, um, only LIHEAP dollars uh, should be included in this report. And so quickly, I just wanna go through a structural overview of section four in module one. Um, you'll have, if you look through the form, you'll notice that you, there's still parts A to C and parts uh, D to F that you'll recognize for the regular funds and the CARES funds, but now the form has also been expanded um, with parts G to I for ARPA funds. So basically what you'll see is three sort of identical almost uh, sections. Um, parts A to C, as I said, will be your total regular grant funds obligated to each type of assistance, your average household benefit amount, um, by assistance type from your regular grant funds and the maximum annual uh, dollar income for a four-person household for each type of assistance. Uh, parts D to F will copy that same format, but you'll be focusing specifically on your CARES funds and your CARES benefits. Parts G to I will be focusing um, specifically on your ARPA funds and your ARPA benefits. And then there are some other parts, um, J through L, um, are not applicable for this year's reporting, so those will just be left alone. And then parts um, M and N will be looking at your total uses and total sources, but those will be auto-calculated. Okay, so let's jump into the line by line. On part A, item one, we're gonna be talking about heating assistance. So here you're gonna indicate the amount of regular funds obligated for heating assistance benefits in FY 2021 in the first column. So this excludes CARES and ARPA funds. These are just your regular LIHEAP funds. Heating ben assistance benefits uh, include funds that are used for regular heating assistance to pay a share of the household's heating bills. There are some other kinds of non-crisis heating assistance, such as furnace repair or replacement done on a non-emergency basis. Those should also be included here, um, but they should you should be adding a note that describes the assistance and indicates the amount of funds used specifically for that. You wanna exclude the cost of administering the heating assistant component here, as there's another line later for administration costs. Now, some grantees um, have an expedited heating assistance um, component. So they don't give a separate crisis benefit, but instead provide expedited heating assistance for people in crisis situations. And so grantees who do this have two options for reporting. 
you can report all funding obligated to assist households with heating assistance, both regular and expedited under the heating assistance line. Um, or you can report the funding obligated to assist households with regular heating assistance under heating assistance and the funding obligated to assist households with expedited heating assistance under crisis assistance. Regardless, what we want to know in the notes is how many households received expedited heating assistance and were reported under um, item X. This is really um, this is really important, especially when you go to look at your data after this report's been submitted and you say you report out on actually you call it a crisis benefit even though it's an expedited heating benefit it's going to be really important for us to be able to tell the difference between what you considered a crisis and what you considered heating so that note is extremely important if especially if you're going to include all of those benefits in one line Okay, so part A, uh, item two of section four is cooling assistance. So on this line, you should indicate the amount of regular uh, LIHEAP block grant funds obligated for cooling assistance. And again, this should be excluding CARES or ARPA funds. Um, and cooling assistance benefits include funds allocated for regular cooling assistance to pay a share of a household's cooling bills or funds for other non-crisis cooling assistance, such as AC installations done on a non-emergency basis. Um, you should add a note that describes any such um, assistance like that that's done on a non-emergency basis. Um, and again, as Melissa said, with heating, you should be excluding the cost of administering your cooling assistance as that goes on a line later on in the form. So crisis assistance is a type of light heap assistance that's often provided no later than 48 hours or 18 hours um, in life-threatening situations after a request for assistance. Now, grantees all set their own criteria for crisis assistance um, in their model plans. And so whatever types of crisis benefits you report in your um, grantee survey should be consistent with what you're reporting in both your model plan and your household report. There are four different categories for crisis assistance benefits in the grantee survey, winter crisis, summer crisis, year-round crisis, and other. And so let's walk through those. In part A, item 3A, winter crisis, the funds that should be reported in this category are any funds obligated to delivering winter crisis assistance to households. And typically, this includes crisis assistance provided under the same timeline as the state's heating assistance program. However, as we mentioned before, your own state defines um, what each crisis um, component looks like and the criteria for it. So um, you need to use those same criteria consistently across your model plan, your household report, and this um, section of the performance data form, the grantee survey. You'll want to exclude the cost of administration, as we've mentioned before, that belongs in another line in the report. And some examples of winter crisis assistance may be bill payment assistance after disconnection or disconnect notice, emergency fuel delivery after running out of fuel or due to imminent risk, or in some cases, crisis assistance is used to cover um, a benefit that is higher than a regular assistance uh, matrix will allow. So the next line is summer crisis. And so some of you have summer crisis programs and um, this typically includes uh, assistance, crisis assistance that's provided under the same timeline as a state's cooling assistance program. Once again, this is set by your own criteria um, in the model plan. You'll wanna exclude the cost of administration as that belongs somewhere else in the form. And examples of summer crisis assistance could include bill payment assistance after disconnection or disconnect notice, or once again, to help pay a bill that may be over the maximum allowable um, benefit for regular cooling assistance.
item 3c looks at year-round crisis now some of you um, may not differentiate between um, winter and summer crisis programs instead you may have a year-round program and um, this typically includes crisis assistance that's provided throughout the year rather than seasonally and um, for some of you, you may provide this year-round assistance in an expedited manner, like we talked about earlier. So for those of you who do an expedited crisis assistance program um, that's not separate from you know, your regular components, go back and take a look at slide 30, um, which will remind you how to report that. There's two different ways. You'll wanna exclude the cost of administration. And once again, uh, Examples of a year-round crisis assistance might be um, emergency fuel delivery after running out of fuel or due to imminent risk of running out of fuel or bill payment assistance um, when a household is facing a disconnection um, notice. And finally, there's other crisis. So there are many of you who have different types of crisis programs that aren't quite bill payment assistance. So for example, um, you may uh, do emergency equipment repair. Some of you may do uh, shelter assistance. Uh, we've, we've seen lots of different options across the nation of the way that people uh, deal with or handle crisis situations. And so this section is really for those, those things that don't fit anywhere else. And what you'll want to do is um, report these under each line one, two, and three. They'll be auto calculated in that top other crisis line, which is why it's blue and grayed out. You'll want to include a brief um, uh, a name of the program and a brief description on the line if possible. You'll want to report any funds obligated to delivering that type of other assistance. And um, any emergency furnace repairs and replacements should be reported on their own line. You'll want to exclude the cost of administration. And if there's something that you think we need to know or context that we need to have when reviewing this form, please include something in the notes. Okay, so now moving on to part A, item four, which is weatherization assistance. And here you should include the amount of regular funds obligated for low cost residential weatherization or other energy related home repairs, if any. Um, you should exclude the cost of administering the LIHEAP weatherization assistance component. Um, and you should include any weatherization funds that were used for other non crisis assistance. Um, you should definitely be adding a note that describes any such assistance. Um, and indicate the funding amount um, for those non-crisis weatherization assistance down in the notes section of your form. Um, and another really big important point here for the weatherization line is that you should be reporting regular federal LIHEAP funds only. Um, in the past, some grantees have incorrectly reported both LIHEAP and Department of Energy weatherization funds together. Um, we really are looking only for your LIHEAP funds that were used for weatherization here. Um, and if you obligated any CARES Act or ARPA funds for weatherization, you would exclude those. Those aren't going to be reported in Part A. Those will be reported either in Part D and or Part G. So we just covered... Um, really this first column, the total funds and awards column for each of the um, big four categories, heating, cooling, crisis, and weatherization. Now we're gonna cover sort of the middle, middle category there all at once, which is the average household benefit column. And here's where you should indicate the average benefit amount for households assisted with each type um, of assistance using your regular LIHEAP funds. So for each type, you should, um, the average household benefit should account for the benefits provided to households with regular LIHEAP funds during the fiscal year. Um, the average benefit should be calculated based on the actual benefits household received. This may differ from your most common benefit amount because there may be some households in your data set that are outliers that got really high or really low amounts. Um, 
if the average household benefit includes benefits other than bill payment assistance, please include a description of the benefit types in the notes section at the bottom of your form. So that was the middle column, the average household benefits column. Um, now we're gonna talk about the uh, maximum annual dollar income for a four person household uh, column. So in this third column, you should be listing the maximum annual or annualized dollar income cutoff or eligibility threshold for a four person household that was in effect at the beginning of federal fiscal year 2021. So that's October 1st of 2020. Um, the federal poverty guidelines that were in effect at that time were the 2020 HHS poverty guidelines. Um, you should report the maximum income based on your income uh, eligibility criteria used for regular LIHEAP assistance. But one thing to note here is that um, obviously uh, different states will have their different components. So maybe your heating assistance starts at one point in time and then your cooling assistance component starts at another time. Um, if any of your components are starting after the release of the 2020 HHS federal poverty guidelines, then you may choose to use the um, 2021 guidelines for that assistance component in your report. But if you do choose to use those updated guidelines, we would just ask that you indicate in the notes section which um, assistance component um, those uh, updated guidelines were used for. Okay, so now let's move on to part B. We're still in the section that's only accounting for regular or traditional LIHEAP funds, not CARES or ARPA. So we're only looking at regular funds here. Um, this includes eight lines for other uses of funds, but only five of them are actually open for editing um, in this year's report. Items eight, nine, and 12 are pre-populated as zeros and cannot be edited. So item six looks at nominal payments. And not all states have this, but some do. Um, and these are payments that deviate from the state's regular normal payment matrix um, because, for example, a household may have gotten only a minimal benefit as part of the SNAP heat and eat or cool and eat program. So these are benefits that are kind of um, off the chart, differ from the matrix, are small um, and um, exceptional. And so only a few states actually um, do this. And um, for the rest of you, you can leave this as a zero. And for those of you who do have it, uh, when you report nominal uh, payments, we'd like you to include a note that explains what those are. So was it a heat and eat uh, SNAP partnership payment or, or something else? Line seven is where you should report the total amount of unobligated funds uh, that you're going to carry over into the next year. So um, just like a checking account, um, you carry funds into the month and you sometimes move funds, hopefully move funds from um, the current month into the next month. And that's what this is looking at. Are there unobligated funds that you're waiting to obligate until FY 2022? The LIHEAP statute allows you to do this for up to 10% of um, your regular funds. So I can basically not obligate up to 10% of my funds in the year that I get them and wait to obligate them until the following year. And that's where this line comes um, into play. So um, uh, if for some reason you have over 10% of unobligated funds, so over 10% of your FY 2021 allocation has not been obligated. Anything over that 10% has to be returned to um, the federal government and is not included in this form, as we mentioned earlier. So um, what that's gonna end up resulting in is a, is a discrepancy between the sources total and the uses total. Um, and so that discrepancy, that difference would be the amount that you're gonna end up sending back to, to OCS.
item seven should um, only include regular unobligated FY 2021 funds, not CARES or ARPA. Um, it should not include funds that were obligated in FY 2021, even if they weren't expended. So as we've mentioned in previous webinars, um, and your state definition probably points out, obligated is not the same as expended. These are funds that have maybe been allocated to your, or contracted out to your local agencies or tied up in other contracts that you're working on, but maybe not expended. That should not be reported here because it's still considered obligated. So this is why looking at your state's definition is really important uh, to understand um, how much of your money is actually obligated and should be reported in other lines of this form. Um, it should only include funds carried over to FY 2022. So if your state returns or needs to return excess obligated funds to the federal government, because say you went over that 10% limit, they shouldn't be included in this line. You only want to include what you're actually carrying over. Um, anything in excess of that that needs to be returned to the government won't be included in this form. And as I mentioned before, excluding return funds from item seven will cause estimated total uses and sources of funds to be different because there's a discrepancy there. Um, you're, you're having to send some money back to OCS. Uh, and if that's the case, what we'll wanna see is a note explaining that. And um, the difference that you see between sources and usage should equal the amount of money that you returned to HHS. Item 10 should report the amount of the state's 2021 block grant allotment um, that was obligated to identify, develop, and demonstrate leveraging activities. And the statute limits this amount to the greater of 0.08% um, of funds payable or $35,000. So there will be a check to make sure that you don't go over or put an amount in that's over these limits um, uh, in the reporting form. Item 11 should report any regular FY 2021 funds obligated for Assurance 16 activities. Assurance 16 activities include those services that encourage and enable households to reduce their home energy needs and the need for energy assistance. For example, needs assessment, counseling, and assistance with energy vendors. The LIHEAP statute limits this amount to 5% of funds payable, so the amount in this line should not be more than 5% of your LIHEAP allocation. And finally, item 13 should report the amount of regular 2021 funds obligated for administration and planning costs. So this should include all state and local administration and planning costs um, or money obligated to um, administration. And this should include both direct and indirect costs charged as administration and planning. And just as with obligations, what your state defines as administration versus program um, is flexible. And so you'll need to pay attention to what your state has defined as administration to really understand what should be included in this line. The, as I just mentioned, grantees have flexibility to define what counts as an administration or planning cost. So you'll want to pay attention to that. It's also important to remember here that the LIHEAP weatherization assistance component there's a cost to administering that as well. And any administration um, used to administer that component should also be included in this line, not in the weatherization line. So um, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Because there's not a field for program-related IT expenditures, um, those should be included in this line, but a note should also be included that says, for example, we spent $500,000 on IT, these have been included in the administration line, but they were actually program costs. So there's just not a place for them on this form. And um, adding this note will alert us to the fact that your admin might be over 10%, but that it's um, because of this, this IT, um, program related IT piece. All right, so that concludes uh, module one section uh, for part B. Now we're going to go ahead and move on to section four, part C, which is uh, just a quick question or a quick section here 
um, that includes just one line of data and then two questions um, for you to answer. So um, Part C item 14 gives you your estimated total uses of regular LIHEAP funds and this is going to be pre-populated by summing items 1 through 4 and items 6 through 13 of section 4 and this one is going to be locked to prevent editing. Um, you should compare the value that is populated here in item 14 against your fiscal records just to make sure that it lines up with what you expected um, but it should be correct um, but if you do feel like there needs to be a correction make sure to contact prize and we can unlock and help you out with that um, part cq1 will ask you if you obligated any funds from your regular fiscal year 2021 LIHEAP grant that weren't actually used to serve the client until fiscal year 2022. Um, for example, you might have obligated funds to weatherize clients' homes during fiscal year 2021, but the crew that actually went out to make the upgrades to the client's home may not have actually gotten there to begin the work until after fiscal year 2022 was already underway. Um, so if you know that's the case, then you would want to mark yes to Q1 um, in section 4 part C, and then you should add a note to the bottom of your form to clarify for which types of assistance um, your yes to Q1 is applying to. And then Q2 asks if the average household benefit data you reported in the middle column of section 4 um, part A, items 1 through 4, include any estimate estimated data due to unique program operation uh, rather than direct calculations. So if you mark yes to Q2, then you should add a note to the bottom of your form to clarify for which types of assistance this applies. And so we just went through line by line everything that's going to be in module four section four parts a through c um, and that's for your regular uh, block grant funds um, section four parts d e and f are for reporting your uses of cares funds in fiscal year 2021 and you're going to use the exact same procedures that we just went through line by line um, for part a b and c except that your total funds and awards, your average household benefit, and your maximum income dollar for a four-person household here should focus only on your CARES funds. Um, they should not include um, your ARPA funds or your regular block grant funds. And one note here is that all CARES funds needed to be obligated by the end of fiscal year 2021. So part E item 21 should be zero dollars for all grantees. And parts G through I are for ARPA funds, and this is really the same spiel that I just gave for the CARES funds. You're going to use the same line by line procedure that we just went through for part A, uh, B, and C, um, except for the fact that your awards, your benefit amounts, um, and your maximum dollar income cutoffs are going to focus only on what was relevant with your ARPA funds, not your regular funds and not your CARES funds. And then one thing here is that we know that some grantees did not obligate any of their ARPA funds in fiscal year 2021. Um, we know that many of you were saving these um, for use in fiscal year 2022 or maybe even beyond. And so if that's the case, if you didn't use any funds, um, then you would report your full amount of ARPA allocation on the carryover line here, which is item 32. So before we move on to module two um, performance measures, I want to make sure that um, we reiterate this is very dense material. It's challenging sometimes to really get a handle on it after looking at slides or listening to a webinar. And so with any of the material that you see in this video, we encourage you to reach out to a prize or your OCS liaison with any questions uh, that you have. And we'll, we'll reiterate that again at the end of this video and provide contact information, but I wanna make sure that we, um, that we, we say that loud and clear. So with that, let's move on to module two performance measures. And we'll start with just an overview. 
the performance measures for LIHEAP have been submitted by state grantees since 2016 um, in module two of the LIHEAP performance data form. And these measures provide good information on the impact of, um, of our program. So we talked about before, you know, the household report talks about who we served and the grantee survey that we just went over talks about how money was obligated and used. But this talks about how the program is transforming the lives of the people that we help. And so some of the um, things that need to be reported in this form include average annual income, benefits and energy bill amounts, occurrences when LIHEAP assistance restored lost energy services, as well as occurrences when LIHEAP assistance prevented the loss of service. And all of this information together gives grantees a nice story to tell um, about their LIHEAP program and gives them the information that they need to help uh, with performance management in terms of either evaluating their program and making improvements. So I'm gonna turn it over to Connor. All right, so quickly, um, I just wanna cover that since the inception of this form back, um, like Melissa said, in 2016, um, it has always, even up and through this most recent year, 2020, fiscal year 2020, it's always just been one tab sort of one continuous form um, you've reported for all your LIHEAP uh, federal funding sources um, and the assistance that you provided with those all together. Um, so in 20, for most of the years, that was just your regular block grant amount that you've received. But in 2020, that was a combination of both um, any regular block grant funds you had and any um, CARES Act funds that you used. And so there was a section, you know, there was just one module two, section five, section six, and section seven, like Melissa just noted. However, for fiscal year 2021, you'll notice that OCS has added two new tabs to module two that ask grantees to submit some additional information. So 2A, like we just said, that's gonna still be the same procedure you've always done. It's going to be all of your households who received any type of LIHEAP assistance, no matter whether that was um, your regular block grant, your CARES, or your ARPA, or some combination of those. But when you go to the second tab here, Module 2B, that's going to ask you to identify and filter down to the subset of households who received only CARES benefits, and then produce the performance measure summary statistics. And then module 2C is going to ask you to filter to the subset of households who received um, ARPA benefits and produce the performance measures summary statistics. And so some households will be included um, in multiple tabs, perhaps if they received a benefit that included both regular funds and CARES or regular and ARPA or CARES and ARPA. Um, but this does not actually mean making any new additional vendor requests. Um, instead, it just means that uh, within your combined program data, you're gonna be identifying and filtering to those CARES and ARPA populations. And then you're gonna be focusing on those benefit amounts that came from CARES and ARPA in those tabs to produce those same statistics. Um, and we'll cover that in more detail in the next few slides, but um, we just wanted to show you here that you can find and navigate between all three of the module two tabs at the bottom of the Excel spreadsheet. And so here I just want to give you a little bit of a visual of what I just showed. So um, this will probably be more helpful for folks when they're reviewing, going back and reviewing the slides, but um, this is exactly what we just showed from before. Um, this is module two A now. It's going to be all your federal funds. So for section five, um, you're looking at your average annual income, average energy bill amounts, total LIHE benefit among households that have 12 months of billing data collected, and then section six occurrences where LIHE restored lost energy service, and section seven occurrences where LIHE assistance prevented loss of service. Module 2B, you can see the CARES folks are a subset, or 2B is a subset of 2A, but you're reporting a section five, a section six, and a section seven for that subset. And then um, there's going to be 2C, which again is a subset of 2A. 
um, but there's going to be a section five, a section six, and a section seven. But like we said, um, any household that is in the 2C subset will also be in 2A. Um, same with 2B, they will also be in 2A, uh, but you, they could also potentially be in both 2B and 2C. So now let's talk about the line by line um, detail of module two, section five, which includes, as uh, Connor mentioned, um, will include all of the, um, all LIHEAP funds. So regular CARES, ARPA um, is gonna be in 2A. And so we're gonna just talk about that quick. This is where we collect the data to understand how the LIHEAP benefits change energy burden. Um, as well as how well benefits are targeted to households with high energy burden, um, which is required by the LIHEAP statute. So we look at things like how much is the energy burden um, before receiving LIHEAP and afterwards, and, and what's the change, and how does this vary by main heating type? We look at are high burden households receiving LIHEAP benefits that are higher or lower, about the same as all households? And we also look at whether high burden households have a greater, equal, or lesser share of their energy bill paid as a result of receiving LIHEAP bill payment assistance. So the easiest way to think about part or section five of this report is that um, we start with a big data set, we move down to a smaller subset and we move down to an even smaller subset. So part A includes all LIHEAP bill payment assisted households um, and whether you have vendor data on them or not. And then part B jumps down to only those households with for whom you have billing data collected because those are the households you're gonna be able to report on and be able to look at their costs. So we know that there's a significant difference in many um, with many grantees between the big number of households in part a um, and sometimes um, the much smaller amount of households in part b we know that there's a drop off there and then high burden households which are a subsection of that part b you're going to take those households with the highest energy burden from part b and report on just those and by looking at these kind of three different levels, we're able to look at how you target benefits. And I guess what this really spells out is that um, these aren't unique data sets. Part A is all your households, part B are, is a section of those households that have billing data, and part C is a section of those households that have the highest energy burden. Okay, so now we're going to start to get into the line by line for module two and the different sections and the different parts. I just want to note that we're going to be um, doing the line by line specifically for module two A, which is all the funds. Um, but um, at the end of each section, we'll include um, a slide or two with just a couple of notes about what you need to look out for when you're repeating that for your CARE subset and your ARPA subset in Module 2B and Module 2C. Um, so we'll start with the um, line by line for um, the Module 2A, Section 5, Part A, which is what is highlighted in red here. It's just one line. And this is where you should report the total number of LIHEAP households by main heating fuel type who received some sort of bill payment assistance from either regular LIHEAP funds, LIHEAP CARES funds, LIHEAP ARPA funds, or some combination of those. Um, LIHEAP bill payment assisted households are defined as any household provided with a LIHEAP benefit used to pay a share of a household's energy bills and utility deposits. So this should include households receiving heating, cooling, and crisis assistance benefits to pay a share of a household's energy bills or utility deposits, or households receiving heat and rent payments. This should not include, or this should exclude, households receiving only LIHEAP weatherization assistance or energy-related equipment repair or replacement services, or households that are only receiving the SNAP um, nominal LIHEAP benefit if applicable. 
So here um, we're showing that you should report on all households that received LIHEAP bill payment assistance during the fiscal year, um, regular and or CARES Act and also and or ARPA by main heating fuel type. Um, Households that receive bill payment assistance but have an unknown main heating fuel type should ultimately be classified in the other fuels column at the very end there. And this breakdown should line up with line 14 of your household report. And here we're just showing with the green and the red that um, the individual uh, fuel types is where you're going to be entering the information. And then the red part under all households is just going to be auto calculated um, based on what you put in the green sections. So here I'm going to talk a little bit about module 2B and 2C. So for part A of module 2B and 2C, you should follow the same procedure that I just outlined for part A and module uh, 2A, except that um, those two. A uh, tab should only focus on the households who received bill payment assistance from CARES and ARPA funds, respectively. So module 2B part A should report the number of LIHEAP households by main heating fuel type who received some sort of bill payment assistance um, from LIHEAP CARES funds. And then 2C part A should report the number of LIHEAP households uh, by main heating fuel type who received some sort of bill payment assistance from ARPA funds. And again, you're going to report in the green, uh, the ones that I've overlaid in green, and then the one that I've overlaid in red will auto calculate. Connor, can you go back to two slides, um, to slide 66? I just want to um, reiterate, as Connor mentioned, any households where you don't know the main heating type should go in the other fuels column. You should also include a note. So if you know, for example, that in this example, 1,000 of the households in the other fuels column are actually an unknown um, uh, main type, you should just note that in the note section, that 1,000 of the households in the other fuels column are actually unknown main heating field type. Um, that will um, help us uh, look at your data more closely. OK, so let's move on to section B. Remember that in the first section that Connor just described, we're talking about any bill payment assisted households. And now we're going to just be looking at households um, within that you know, first section that have all the required data. And so let's go through what that might look like. If you want to include a household in section five, part B, you need to have the following information. You need to know their main heating fuel type, you need to know their annual household income. You need to know their annual total LIHEAP bill payment assistance benefits. And so we'll talk about this later, but this is the sum of all their benefits, um, heating, cooling, crisis, supplemental, um, any bill payment money that they got through the year would be included in this sum. You need to understand the client's total annual main heating fuel bill. And if electric isn't their main heating, you also need to have their total annual electric bill. So when you look at your list of clients or households, um, you're going to only pick out for section um, five part B, those households that have all of these fields completed. The source um, on the right hand side tells you where you might get that information. So for example, Main heating fuel type and income are things that you collect at the time of client application. You may need to go into your system to look at the sum of their annual benefits over the year, and you'll likely request the data from vendors either in real time or at the end of the year um, to get their annual main heating fuel and electric costs. Grantees should uh, follow the following steps to request and collect vendor data. You'll want to identify the top energy vendors for each fuel. And right now, um, the guidance is that you need to be requesting fuel uh, cost information from your top five gas and um, natural gas and electric vendors. And this means the, um, the, the top five who served the most households. And then the top 10 from your fuel oil, propane, and other types of fuel. 
you'll request data from the sample of vendors. So for example, you'll send them names and account numbers of the people you'd need annual cost uh, data for. And then when that vendor data comes back in, you'll take a look at it and review it and make sure that you have the data that you need, um, that you have a full 12 months of data for those households. Uh, and then you'll end up compiling that with the other information included in the list above. So since all of these data come from different places, you're going to need to combine all of this data together to form a single data set. And as I mentioned before, you're only going to identify and keep those households with complete energy bill data. That means that they have main heating and electric if, if electric isn't their main heating type and they have 12 months of electric bills. That's something you'll actually put on your vendor request is asking them to let you know if it's 12 months worth of data. And if it's not, then they won't be included in this form because we need both the annual main heating and the annual um, uh, electric amount in order to calculate these performance measures. Okay, so now we'll move into the line by line. And again, we're going to be starting with focusing on 2A, and then I will clarify any special considerations you need for um, 2B and 2C. So, section five, um, part B, item one in module 2A, you're going to be reporting an unduplicated count of all LIHEAP bill payment assisted households for whom you collected their complete energy expenditure data by main heating fuel type. And again, um, what's overlaid in green here is where you'll be reporting, you'll put in each, the value for each individual main heating fuel type, and then the all uh, column will automatically um, auto-calculate. In part B, you're gonna report the average annual household income um, or in item two, you're going to report the average annual household income for households in part B. So for everyone you just reported on line one, you're going to report their average household income. And this includes households with very low or zero income. You're going to report the gross household income. Some of you actually use a net income to calculate um, a determine a, a household's benefit. But for reporting purposes, you should always be using the gross household income. And it's important that you remember to verify that you're using the annual income amount. Many database systems or LIHEAP data systems actually require the intake worker to put in a monthly amount. And so sometimes that's what it kicks out in the data. And so pay attention to that and make sure that you're actually getting annual um, amounts in for each of the heating fuel, fuel types online too. So for item three, you're going to be reporting the average annual total LIHEAP benefit per household um, for the households that are in your Part B sample. So here the steps to remember are that all households reported in line one should be included as part of this calculation. Um, you should be adding up all bill payment assistance benefits a household received prior to calculating the average amount for each group. So we know that some households might receive two different LIHEAP benefits um, from your office at two different times of the year. Um, so those would be added together um, before you're calculating the average for everyone in your Part B sample. And then you should be um, excluding all non-bill payment assistance amounts. So that would be any benefits that went towards weatherization or strictly towards equipment repair or replacement, things like that. In line four, you're gonna report the average annual main heating bill for households in the Part B sample. So remember that the data is collected from a sample of energy vendors. There are some, um, there are some grantees who collect it from all of their vendors and that's great, but you're only required to get it from those top five and top 10 vendors uh, for each heating type. This should include all required customer payments, such as monthly service charges, usage charges, and taxes, 
but it shouldn't include optional charges. So some people have on-bill financing for say a furnace or a water heater or whatever it might be. Those things are optional and should not be included. But anything that the customer is required to pay um, should be included in the annual cost provided by the vendor. For electric main heat households, the electricity bill is the main heating fuel bill. And so it should be reported on this line, not on the electric line. So that's an important distinction to make. In item five, you're gonna report the annual electricity bill for households in your, in your Part B sample. And so once again, you're only collecting elect electricity data from a sample of your vendors. Um, and it should include the same types of costs. So when your vendor says, well, what do you want me to include in the annual cost? Things like monthly service charges and usage charges and taxes, anything the customer's required to pay should be included, but not things that they've opted into. For electric main heat households, you're actually gonna report zero here. Um, so if electricity is their main heat, you're gonna include that on the main heat line and you would put a zero here. This is one area where um, I think um, some grantees struggle. You're going to collect electric data for anyone who got a LIHEAP benefit, even if you didn't pay the electric bill. So many of you will only, for example, heating assistants will only pay the main heating fuel type, which might be say natural gas but you'll want to still go out to the electric company for that customer and get their electric data so that we get a total residential energy bill. Um, and that's an important distinction to make. You're not just requesting it for the people um, who got benefits at that utility. And so we have lots of resources we're gonna show you at the end, but that's an, that's an important distinction. And if you have questions about that, please reach out and contact us. So that, that was all the line by line for module 2A, um, section five, part B. Now I just wanna quickly go over um, how you're gonna do that and modify it just slightly for 2B and for 2C. So to complete part B on the tab for module 2B, which is your care subset, you simply need to take the part B sample that you found for module 2A and drop any households who did not receive at least a partial bill payment assistance benefit that was funded by CARES. Um, so that is moving from the green circle here, which would be um, module 2A, what we just found, all the households for whom you collected uh, electric um, and main heating billing information for, and dropping down to this smaller subset here, the yellow subset, which is those that received CARES, whom you also have their complete um, billing data for. And so you'll use the exact same line by line um, steps to calculate the summary statistics for items one, two, four, and five um, that we just showed um, from this smaller subset here. But the one thing that is a little bit different or that we really wanna draw your attention to is that the benefit amount here should focus only on the benefit amount that they received from CARES. So if you look here at this example that I have on the screen, um, you can see that in these, we've got a, a fictional state here that served 25,000 households with bill payment assistance um, in fiscal year 2021. Um, 15,000 of those they were able to collect the complete expenditure data for. Um, you can see they've got uh, an average annual income of just about 12 and a half thousand. Um, their total LIHEAP benefit, so that would be whatever they got um, from both um, CARES and from their regular benefit amount was $600. Their main heating bill was $1,250 and their average annual electric bill was $1,420. Um, when we drop down to the CARES subset, you see that we drop down um, so of those 15,000, only 5,000 received CARES. Um, they had a lower income than the slightly larger set. And their CARES benefit was much smaller. It was only $100 worth um, of their overall benefit was from CARES on average. And you can see that their bills are a little bit different as well. Um, but we really wanna draw that distinct distinction that 
the benefit amount that you report in um, 2B and 2C is only what comes from um, their CARES or their ARPA amounts. And so there's another slide here that you know explains the exact same thing for ARPA, um, but it, it really is just the same procedure. You're taking your overall um, households for whom you collected their full data, you're dropping to the subset of those that uh, received some sort of ARPA assistance, and then for item three on 2C, you're reporting just their ARPA um, benefit amount or the portion of their benefit that came from ARPA. Okay, so you've reported the total number of bill payment assisted households. You've then taken out of those households just the ones that have complete billing information. And now we're gonna take one more subset. Out of section B, we're, we're going to pull those households with the highest energy burden and run the same data. So let's just talk about what that looks like. Module 2A, section five, part C, reports the same information as part B, except that the part C sample will be limited to just those highest burden households. So for, for the performance data form, high burden has a specific definition. You're going to take the top 25% of households from part B with the highest calculated energy burden. And those are the households that will be used to calculate the statistics in part C. To identify the high burden household, you'll wanna follow these steps or something very similar. You're gonna calculate their total, um, for each household in part B, you're gonna calculate the total residential energy bill. So that's the sum of their main heating bill and their electric bill. And you're going to calculate the energy burden for each household. And this energy burden, if you remember, is um, the percentage of their income that they pay on bills. So it's going to be the, um, the amount of their total residential energy bill divided by their income. For people who have zero income um, or whose calculated burden goes above 100%, you're gonna wanna go in and assign a value of 100% burden to those households. Um, this is especially true with the zero income households because you'll get calculation errors when you go to run this in Excel or Access or, or SQL or whatever database you're using. So anyone with zero income should just automatically be set to a 100% energy burden. Once you've calculated an energy burden for all of your households, if you imagine this like an Excel spreadsheet, you're gonna basically sort this set um, from highest to lowest, and you're gonna draw the top 25% of those households um, uh, out of the data set to use in Part C, regardless of their fuel type. So we don't want the top 25% highest energy burden in each fuel type. We want you to look at the whole set, calculate the energy burden, sort it, and pull the top 25% regardless of their fuel type. And then you're gonna walk through and produce the same statistics we just did in Part B, only using this sample of households. So this is a nice picture that shows you um, exactly what you're doing. Step one, you're gonna calculate their um, total residential bill using both their main heating and electric bills. Um, step two, you're gonna calculate their energy burden, which is um, their uh, annual bill divided by their annual income. For those households with zero income in step three, you're gonna actually go in and set them up automatically with a 100% um, energy burden so that you don't get that um, mathematical or, uh, error when you run this report. Step four, you're gonna sort them. And so you can see that these have been sorted not based on main heating fuel type or anything else other than energy burden. And it goes from 100% down to 6%. And then you're gonna take the top 25%. In this case, that's the top two. Um, and um, those are what you're gonna use in part C of the report. So Melissa just walked you through the process of how you um, get to your part C sample. And then once you have that, you should go in and complete um, module 2A section five part C items one through five um, using the same line by line instructions as we used for part B items one through five. They're the exact same 
um, I guess, statistics. It's just that now you're calculating them with that more restricted high burden sample, your Part C sample. And again, I've got visuals here to show how you would do that for um, CARES and for ARPA. I'm not gonna go fully into that here. I think it's more useful to read what's on the slide here um, than it is to try to walk all the way through it again and again. But really the, the core process um, that we wanna reiterate is that for 2A, you're taking all your households, you're figuring out which ones you've got full billing data for and reporting that in part B, then you're gonna narrow down to your high burden households and report that in part C. For the ARPA um, funding, you're going to take all the households that you serve with ARPA, you're gonna figure out which ones of those you got their full billing data for, and then you're gonna figure out which ones of those um, were your 25% highest burden. And then the same thing for CARES. Um, so go ahead and look through these, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and just move on to uh, part D or give it to Melissa to do part D. So part D is all auto calculated using the information from section B and C. Remember earlier we said that we use these different subsets to compare how you're targeting your benefits to the highest burden households, which is a requirement of the LIHEAP statute. And so the benefit targeting index is the first thing you're gonna see in line D and it um, basically tells you um, whether or not you are paying higher benefits to higher burden households. And to understand these, um, Connor's included this really great chart, anything less than 100 means that um, the amount you're providing to high burden households is actually less than what you're giving to all households. 100 um, would be balanced, which means that the amount you're giving to high burden households is equal to the average benefit amount provided to all households. And greater than 100 means that you're actually doing a, a good job of targeting in that you're giving higher benefits to higher burden households. So when we look at this line of numbers here, for example, and you look at that 137, which is all households regardless of fuel type, what this would tell us at 137 is that on average, your state is giving 37% higher benefits to high burden households than to all households. And so this is a good number to have. Um, and the purpose of these numbers obviously is, um, is not to compare states against one another, but rather for you to use year over year to try to um, improve how well you're targeting benefits and by fuel type, you'll, there's a number for each fuel type here. And so you can see that in some areas you're doing a better job of targeting than others. And so this would allow you to go back into your benefit matrix and see if you can make improvements that would um, give you better targeting across all fuel types. Section or line E does the same thing, only it looks at burden reduction targeting. And so this is, this is not a super intuitive concept, but the idea here is looking actually at the, not just the amount of money we're giving you, but the amount of the bill it covers. So um, in this case, you see the, the 108 um, here in the first line, and that basically means that in this particular state, um, the LIHEAP payment is covering 8% more of the, um, an 8% higher share of the energy bill than it is for all households. This is um, something that takes a little while to click. And we have a lot of resources on the performance management website that will actually walk you through your scores and explain exactly what they mean and what you might do to start improving them. So I encourage you to take a look at, at this um, in a little bit more detail. But for the purpose of reporting, know that these numbers are auto-calculated for you based on the data that you've um, provided in sections A, B, and C. So now let's talk about um, the last two sections of module two, restoration of home energy service and prevention of home energy loss. And we'll start with restoration in uh, section six. 
So this section requires you to report specific information on the number of occurrences where LIHEAP assistance led to the restoration of a household's energy during the fiscal year. So in other words, um, this means that if a household came in already disconnected, their energy service was restored as a result of LIHEAP. Or if they were out of fuel, fuel was delivered as a result of LIHEAP or LIHEAP was used to repair or replace inoperable home energy equipment. One of the key things to remember about this measure um, and this section of the form is that it's not an unduplicated count of households. We know that there are households who may come in for heating assistance and then again for cooling assistance and in each situation they're coming in with a disconnection um, or they've already been disconnected or they've already run out of fuel. So this particular part of the report counts occurrences. So a household that came in say twice is going to be counted twice in this section. This actually makes it a little bit easier to report than looking at um, unduplicated households. So if we go line by line, this is where we're going to report the number of occurrences during the fiscal year in which a LIHEAP assistance led to the restoration of households energy service after disconnection. That's what we're gonna be looking at on the first line. And so these are electric and natural gas households because they're utilities. You're gonna report based on the fuel source where the LIHEAP benefit was applied. So unlike the previous section where you're gonna report the households in their main heating type, regardless of whether the, where the benefit was applied, this is actually the opposite. You're going to report where the benefit was applied. So um, this means that if I'm a natural gas customer, but it was my electric that LIHEAP paid to keep me from getting disconnected, I'm gonna be counted in the electric column. Steps to remember, um, your households can once again, have multiple occurrences of disconnection throughout the year. And a LIHEAP payment can be used multiple times throughout the year, and either in different program components or, or even within the same program component to um, restore home energy. And so you're going to be counting the count of times that it happened, not the count of households. In the cases of electric prepay clients whose account ran out of funds and who had their energy service restored um, with a LIHEAP benefit, you're gonna count those, but we'd like you to include a note. It helps us better understand um, what the prepay situation looks like. In section six, item two, you're gonna be reporting the same things, but for this case, you're gonna be reporting it in the, it's, a, it's all about deliverable fuels. So this is where LIHEAP assistance resulted in the delivery of fuel after the household had already run out. And once again, this is a fuel source where the light heat benefit was applied, um, where the light heat benefit was applied, not necessarily their main heating, heating fuel source for the home. And you're gonna include each occurrence of, um, of the light heat benefits that um, restored home energy. I think it's important to you to point out here in all of these cases, both in restoration and prevention measures that this isn't, for many states, this isn't just gonna be your crisis program or your crisis benefits. For some of you, it might be that, but some of you use normal benefits or regular benefits to restore home energy or to um, alleviate a crisis. Um, they may not need a crisis benefit. They may be able to use a regular benefit to do that. So uh, be careful not to limit this to just looking at your crisis benefits when you count these numbers. This is, it, this is any kind of bill payment assistance benefit, regular or crisis, that resulted in these outcomes. In item three, we're gonna be talking about repairing and replacing inoperable equipment using LIHEAP funds. And so, once again, this is the fuel source for the equipment that was repaired or replaced. So, um, it may not be um, the main heating fuel type for the home, but it's where the money was invested. Households could have experienced multiple instances um, to restore or replace inoperable equipment. This isn't common, but it, it does happen, and so you should include each occurrence. This includes red tagged energy equipment. Um, for the purpose of this report, red tagged equipment is, include, or is considered inoperable. And 
this is one area where you're going to need to potentially collaborate with weatherization partners if you don't do weatherization in-house. Uh, in order to get data on equipment repair and replacement that occurred that um, replaced an inoperable furnace, for example, or heat pump or whatever it might be, um, you're going to need to get that information from your weatherization vendors. We have data collection guides that will help you ask your your um, partners the right questions to get this data, and I encourage you to go visit those on the performance management website if you have questions. Okay, so I'm going to quickly go over, Melissa just walked us through all the steps you need to do um, module 2A, section 6. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the additional tabs, module 2B um, for CARES and module 2C for ARPA. Um, so just like section 5, there were no changes made to the actual process um, and procedures for the section. Um, but you will still need to go in and do those additional tabs where you're filtering down um, just to the subset of, for 2B, identify and filter to the subset of households who received CARES benefits and produce the restoration summary statistics for that subset. And then for 2C, identify and filter to the subset of households who received ARPA benefits and produce the restoration summary statistics for them. Um, so again, I've got, um, a visual here. So for 2B, you'll just take the restoration sample that you found for 2A and drop any occurrences where the restoration was not attributable, at least in part, to a benefit that was funded by CARES. Um, you would then try, uh, you would then fill in items 1, 2, and 3 in module 2B using the same procedures outlined for module 2A. And then the same thing for ARPA. Um, drop any occurrences where the restoration was not attributable, at least in part, to a benefit that was funded by ARPA. Um, you then just need to fill in one, two, and three um, using those same procedures. So it's a similar process um, as what we just talked about to document prevention of loss of home energy. And so what what this looks at is um, how did LIHEAP um, prevent uh, home energy loss for people who are imminent risk of losing their home energy? So if you want to go to the next slide. So the key word here is at risk. A lot of times weatherization programs, um, even through LIHEAP, will say replace um, a um, furnace or equipment repair and replacement um, for efficiency purposes, but this is really all about identifying those households who are at risk of losing their home energy and then figuring out whether LIHEAP averted that risk. So this might include households with a utility past due or disconnect notice who haven't already been disconnected but are, are about to be. Households with limited fuel so in some states, this looks like 25% um, of the tank or less or, or a, a different percentage, but there's some kind of measure to say these folks are really low, and if we don't give them a light heat benefit, we believe they will um, run out of fuel. And then households in need of re equipment repair and replacement. Once again, this is tricky because how do you um, quantify whether a furnace is about to kick the bucket? Um, there are ways states are doing it. We have some guidance. but in all cases, this is really at risk. And grantees, you as grantees, need to define the criteria for that at risk statement. Once again, this is not an unduplicated count of households. Um, in fact, I would say many households have experienced, um, if, if you give more than one benefit out per year, there's a good chance that several of your households um, have been at risk when they come in for a benefit because they are have a disconnect notice, for example. And so um, each occurrence should be counted and reported. So in item one, you're, this is where we're going to count utility um, disconnect or past due notices. Um, in this case, you're going to report based on the fuel source where the light heat benefit was applied, the number of households um, where LIHEAP um, averted that risk and, and prevented a home energy loss. You're going to include each occurrence 
and you're going to exclude households that have already been disconnected. They should be counted in the previous measure. For prepay households, you're going to count those households whose accounts were low on funds uh, and who received a LIHEAP benefit that prevented the loss of their home energy service. A quick note here, there are some grantees who early on in this reporting process said, well, everyone that comes in our door is at risk um, because they're low income and energy bills are tough to pay. And while that's true, this is really looking at imminent risk. So that's why we've we've clarified by saying um, a past due or a shutoff notice um, are really good indicators for uh, for someone who uses electric or natural gas and is at imminent risk of having their uh, energy, of losing their home energy. The next line looks at deliverable fuels, same concepts, just looking at different fuel types, fuel oil, propane, and other fuels. You'll wanna um, uh, re report based on the fuel source where the LIHEAP benefit was applied. You'll want to um, remember that households could have happened, this could have happened multiple times and you wanna count each occurrence and that households that are already out of fuel should be counted in the previous measure. And finally, we're looking at repair and replacement of operable equipment um, to prevent imminent home energy loss. So when a household comes in um, or an audit is done and they say, look, this furnace has <laughs> isn't gonna last through the month, it's working, but it's not gonna work much longer. And if we don't fix it, they're not gonna have heat or, or not gonna have cooling or whatever it might be. Um, that is what imminent risk looks like when we're talking about equipment repair and replacement. And it's especially important in this measure because sometimes you are getting data from partners, weatherization partners to, to complete this part of the report for you to have really clear criteria set up for what that looks like. Um, there's one state that has actually a list of model numbers and names of different equipment. And you don't need to go to that extent, but having a clear definition so that when an auditor walks through the house and looks at everything, they can click a box that says, yes, if we don't replace this, um, the house is at risk of losing their home energy. So for those households who received equipment repair and replacement that prevented that loss, you're, you're going to be reporting them in this line. You wanna report where the fuel source of the equipment was, not necessarily their main heating type. Once again, it's not common that you see multiple occurrences of equipment repair and replacement through the year, but it can happen and they should all be reported. Exclude repair and replacements of red tagged energy equipment. It's considered inoperable and should be included in the other line. And um, once again, Getting this data might include coordination with your weatherization partners or, or departments in, in your state. And so you'll wanna work closely with them to uh, identify the data they need to provide you and what they should be looking for when, they, um, when they're compiling their data or looking at households. So I mentioned earlier, there's a data collection guide on the performance management website that helps walk you through the prevention and restoration uh, criteria and how to get this data from partners and I encourage you to take a look at that if you'd like further information. So just as with the um, other two sections, section five and section six of module two um, for section seven, you're also going to need um, to use the exact same procedures we just um, noted. Um, but repeat them with a different subset. So for module 2B, you're filtering down to those who received CARES, and for module 2C, you're filtering down to those who received ARPA. So um, you just need to take the prevention sample that you found for module 2A and drop any occurrences where the prevention was not attributable, at least in part, to a benefit that was funded by CARES. Um, for um, 2B, and then for um, 2C, you just need to take that, again, that sample, um, the prevention sample that you found for 2A, drop any occurrences where the prevention was not attributable, at least in part, to the benefit that was provided by ARPA, and then use those same procedures to fill in uh, your items 1, 2, and 3. So now let's move to the summaries. So 
the performance data form expired in April, as Connor mentioned, and submitted proposed changes to the form um, to OMB were approved in late February. An action transmittal with instructions to complete the form was sent out on March 14th, and the initial due date for the form is March 31st, 2022. If you need an extension um, to complete this report, please email your uh, LIHEAP program specialist or liaison to request that. And as we discussed earlier, um, similar to what was done in fiscal year 2020, um, OCS is going to be asking grantees to submit the 2021 performance data form using Basecamp and Excel rather than OLBC. Um, each grantee will be receiving a communication um, to provide you with a link to your Basecamp folder where you can get that Excel spreadsheet. And again, um, even though you guys received an example with the action transmittal, it's really important that you um, utilize the spreadsheet that will be provided via that um, Basecamp folder because, as we said, especially in the grantee survey, um, there are fields that are pre-populated with specific information for your particular state. So for module one, just to be clear about updates, there are no major changes to the form structure or layout for the FY 2021 grantee survey, which is module one. The primary change from last year's report is that grantees must now report information on the uses of LIHEAP ARPA funds during FY 2021. And any additional minor changes are described in sections three and four. And for module two, in terms of updates, um, the general process, again, has not changed. Um, tab 2A um, is still basically what the performance data form has always been, which is just your performance measures for all LIHEAP households, regardless of the federal income source. The only uh, change is that you're going to be repeating the process that you did for tab 2A. Um, in tab 2B, but filtering only to CARES households and using only benefits that were provided by CARES. And then in 2C, you're going to be doing the same exact process as for 2A, but you're going to be filtering only to households that received ARPA benefits and focusing um, for benefit amounts only on the amount that came from ARPA. As we've mentioned throughout the webinar, there are many, many resources available to help you with reporting, including an entire required report section on the performance management website, a check before you submit document that actually allows you to go through and look at some of the validations that Apprise does when they get your report um, so that you can make sure your numbers are correct, as well as past data, performance um, data form 18 instructions and poverty guidelines. We also have um, prior guidance for the um, fiscal year 2020 performance data form. Um, there are also the performance measures resources and data reliability assessment tools on the LIHEAP performance management website. Um, there is a standardized check before you submit document and there are also um, past years data for performance measures both for your state and others in the um, data warehouse on the performance management website. And in addition to all of these resources, there are a number of people um, on standby ready to help states um, with whatever they need with this reporting. We've helped a lot of states before. Um, we just encourage you not to spend too much time kind of beating your head against the wall. You know, when you run into something, give us a call and we'll um, walk you through it. And um, and, and talk with you through any questions that you might have. We've included the link for OCS representatives or liaisons here, as well as a number of us from the Apprise team who are ready and willing to help. We appreciate your time. I hope this training video was helpful. And once again, encourage you to reach out with any questions. Thanks. <laughs>